Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. This is the first time, it's a very special moment, this is the first time that the issue of women's leadership and gender gaps is being addressed here in the Congress Hall at the World Economic Forum. I think it's a testimony to the fact that the um, issue of women's leadership is so critical to today's economy and society. Women make up one half of the human capital that's available to any economy. If that one half isn't educated, isn't healthy, isn't integrated into the economy and into decision-making structures, countries will lose their competitive potential. I'm going to speak just briefly about the Women Leaders and Gender Parity Program at the World Economic Forum. There are essentially three parts to the program. The first is benchmarking and analysis. Every year we produce a global gender gap report that ranks countries according to the size of their gender gaps, over 130 countries, on health, education, economic participation, and political empowerment criteria. Second, our work focuses on best practices. What are the successful interventions that actually help close gender gaps? And third, we aim to bring together the leaders, influential leaders such as yourself, that can actually help close those gaps and by applying some of that data analysis, policies, and practices. And finally, of course, we aim to increase the participation of women leaders here at the World Economic Forum. Ten years ago, when we started out in this program, there were 9% women present here at Davos. Today, there are 17%. Still some way to go, but there are signs of change. Amongst our young global leaders community and our shapers community, we've achieved 40%. And last year, the World Economic Forum introduced a quota of 20% for our strategic partners. I'll now hand over to Nicholas Kristof, the moderator for our spectacular panel. Thank you. Thank you, Sadia. Well, I have to say that this is something of a milestone. Uh, there's been a tradition here to regard women's empowerment as um, something that is worthy and nice, but also a soft issue and kind of secondary. And to have this discussion with this extraordinary panel being held here in this large hall is really a, a reflection of the degree to which this issue has grown up and has graduated to a perception that if you want to address the world's key issues, uh, whether it be global poverty or economic development, climate change, uh, insecurity, then you have to do it by educating uh, girls and bringing those educated women into the formal labor force and into positions of power, whether it be here at the World Economic Forum or in the corridors of power all over the world. We have this terrific panel to uh, discuss these issues with. Uh, from my left, we have uh, Prime Minister Inglak Shinawat of uh, Thailand, the, the first woman Prime Minister of Thailand. We have uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate, uh, also chair of the elders. Uh, Michelle Bachelet, the first woman president of Chile and now head of UN Women. Uh, Talal al Zain, who is the CEO of Mom Telecat Holdings in Bahrain and uh, a real leader in empowering women in the business community, not only in Bahrain, but around the world. And Sheryl Sandberg, uh, the COO of, of Facebook and uh, worldwide a voice for focusing on women's talent and bringing it to bear on all kinds of global issues. When economists try to explain the economic dynamism of Asia, then while there are many different business models country by country in Asia, one thing that they pointed to is the way countries have made increasingly good use of the female half of the population as part of the economic recipe for success across Asia. And I'd like to invite Prime Minister Inglak to start by uh, giving us her sense of how Thailand has used the female half of its population as part of its extraordinary economic dynamism. Prime Minister Inglak. Ladies and gentlemen, may I speak in Thai to make sure that I, I deliver all the content clearly? Sadiqa. 
Good afternoon. Uh, distinguished guests, it's a great honor and pleased to be here to have this opportunity to say some remarks and to join the debate on women as a way forward. Especially happy. I feel that it's very lucky that I was born in the Thai society which has gender equality between men and women. I had the opportunity to have education and then to work in the private sector as, an exec as a high-level executive. And most importantly, today, I have the opportunity given by the Thai people throughout the country to be Prime Minister, the first woman Prime Minister of Thailand. Even though I feel that I have great fortune, but the reality today is that in all regions around the world, women still face many challenges such as gender inequity, inequality. Women have less education. And the, the studies have shown that they've had received less education than men. They have less access to capital. It's more difficult. It makes the income uh, that will be less and therefore unable to, to develop the family. More than that, there are women who are victims of sexual harassment and violence and violations. With regard to the, there are some disadvantages of women, such as in their physique and their strength, but I see that being a woman, there are many advantages and strengths which can make us uh, equals and work with men as equals, whether it's being meticulous, uh, the understanding of problems, the ability to be conciliatory, and also the mother instinct, which understands children and youth, and understands the, the weakness and frailties of women which we can resolve. Another study has indicated that women have better capabilities to save, to make savings. About 70% to 90% of women that are coming from, uh, generated by women, come back to the family. So I believe that if women have the opportunity to express their strengths equally, it will be an important factor that will help pursue sustainable de development and also promote security. Today, if you ask me how, what's the population of Thai women and women around the world, I have 50 percent. This is another gap. This is another potential that we should use of so that they can contribute and have a role to play, whether it's in the society, economics, and politics. Therefore, the creation of the empowerment of women must, must begin with uh, changing deep-rooted problems such as in culture and in society, these perceptions, and more importantly, we should attack the problem at its grassroots. For my government, the policy is clear, which is to create a national women development fund, first time ever in Thailand, and we hope that this will help women become a major force in building society in the country. Uh, this fund will not only resolve basic problems of women, such as to get access to funding and to resolve uh, the violations of human rights that happens with women. It will also be an important factor in developing the potential of women so that they can contribute and, and themselves sustain themselves, their families, and to develop their strengths and networking of women throughout the country. Uh, in addition to helping women, I have, I'm able to support the idea of the girl effect. So they will have education because a girl, uh, when you educate a girl, it is valuable and you can create a strong contributor to society in the future. From statistics that we have seen, women who have had education, the opportunities, to be sexually harassed or to have violence against them has been reduced. If you give opportunities for women for education, especially for girls, then it will enhance opportunities for income generation for the family, and this will increase. Therefore, 
I underscore the fact that ch uh, girls and youths who are women are an important f uh, aspect of the development of society, economy, and global politics. I really hope that the exchange of views uh, that we have today in this debate, which comprises both men and women with great success in these areas, and those who understand the problems of women, it will be another important step to increase momentum forward to develop the role of women and to have them uh, as a higher role, uh, as an important force, uh, equal, equal with men. Uh, finally, may I take this opportunity to inform you that Thailand will be the host of the World Economic Forum on East Asia in Bangkok from 30th of May to the 1st of June this year under the topic there will be discussions on uh, development of the world uh, in economic development and other aspects and the role of women and that is another important aspect that we will discuss. I will invite all of you to to uh, understand Thailand and join this meeting in this World Economic Forum that we will host. And also, may I take this opportunity to inform you that we have a Thailand night at the Central Sport Hotel this evening uh, at 7.30 p.m. until 10 p.m. tonight. And you will see the culture of Thailand and also the potential of Thailand. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Madam Prime Minister. Um, I should say that in a little bit, I'm going to invite some questions from the audience. So uh, keep in mind, uh, think, some, think, think some questions up for just a little bit. Um, now, uh, Michelle Bachelet, in a sense, your new role as head of UN Women reflects the degree to which the UN sees investing in women as a way to address all kinds of global problems. And you've been, I think, very articulate about the fact that this isn't a matter of charity but a matter of actually solving problems, uh, that women aren't the problem, they're the solution. Can you talk a little bit about how this, how investing in girls does actually solve global problems? Well, first of all, uh, even uh, uh, Prime Minister mentioned some of them. We know that, for example, when investing in education in girls, and particularly when not only in primary education, but also in secondary education, we will see the uh, important drop on early pregnancy, and that will lead to an important drop of uh, maternal mortality because m the majority of maternal mortality in developing countries is mainly between 15 and 19 years old. So uh, that's an important issue. The other thing is diminish the early marriage, uh, particularly early forced marriage. And it has been seen it diminishes also the risk of uh, uh, getting infected with HIV or, or, or ad acquiring AIDS. The second thing that is very important is in terms of an extra year of primary school uh, produces a, a, a boost on a girl's eventual wage on 10 to 20 percent. An extra year in secondary school has a very important effect also 15 to 25 percent in, in future wages of, of a girl. The second thing is that when we know, according to um, Food and Agricultural Organization, that if we would give women the same asset, not more than men, in terms of access to land, access to credit, access to technical assistance, water, and so on, uh, it will uh, increase the national uh, yield crops in 4%, and it will permit us to take out of hunger 100 to 150 million people. So every, there's so much evidence that investing in girls and in women is not only, as you say, I said with other words, I say it's not only the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. But it's the smart thing to do. If there's an economic return here, I mean, this is a pretty smart community of investors here. If there's an economic return, then why doesn't the market invest in girls by itself? Why do we have to intervene? Well, I have been asking myself that question because uh, as you see any, not only on international community, in any uh, politically correct statement, women are essential. You mention it. Women are essential in the MDGs and the development area. Women are essential in, in, the, in the development as a whole, uh, but it's not happening. Why? I believe that probably because we need to work much harder with the business community so they can uh, increase uh, the opportunities for women to, to have a possibility of better jobs. 
We need to increase the opportunity. We need also to, to I would say, work at the country levels in terms of uh, how we ensure that women not only study the traditional study, usually as caregivers with very low salaries, but also go much more in science, uh, innovation, technology, and so on. So there is a part here that must be done by the by, by, uh, private sector, but also by government. Um, Archbishop, you uh, and the elders are addressing all kinds of global problems uh, all around the world, and yet one of those that you and your colleagues have really chosen to focus on has been the empowerment of girls, and in particular the end of child marriage. Why do you give such a priority to focusing on girls? I would have thought actually it was the answer is obvious. Uh, We've already heard, but I mean, when uh, young girls uh, are involved in sexual activity, uh, infant mortality increases. But very straightforwardly, the evidence is that, I mean, if we do not, in fact, end child marriage, we can kiss goodbye to six of the eight Millennium Development Goals. I mean, you are not going to be able to do anything about poverty uh, because a, a child bride has to drop out of school usually. That means she's not going to be employable or if employable at very, very low salaries. The health question the un universalizing primary school education, maternal uh, health, uh, you go on and, and it seems like, I mean, why don't we get it into our heads that the solution is straightforward and simple. We won't make it without the women. God told, God, God, God told Adam, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not good for this guy to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> it is part of who we are. It is, it is that we aren't. I'm just thinking, for instance, of things like compassion, gentleness, caring. I mean, those are part of what it means to be feminine. And I think Hitler happened because his mom did not dangle him. And so he ended up with no sense of security and went out to try to prove that he was someone by clobbering others. Women are totally indispensable for the continued existence of our society. Thank you. I need the, help. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the men. Please make sure that they don't have weapons. <laughs> Everybody's been disarmed, I hope. Um, <laughs> um, I'd like to turn the conversation a little bit to what specific kinds of interventions will actually make a difference. I mean, we, we can agree on the need for much greater equality, but of course, whether we're talking about South Africa or whether we're talking about the corporate suite in New York, there is profound inequality, and we all know that. So what can we actually do to go about creating that greater equality? And to the extent that many of the people here come from the business community, Talal Zain, I'd like to ask you, you've, you're somebody who has pioneered this. Um, what can one do, and, you know, and what are the returns from a profit-making point of view, why does it make good business sense for a company to take those kinds of steps? Sure. Uh, Nick, uh, first of all, I look at it from two angles to try to close the gap. One 
is, as Michelle said, is the right thing to do. But second, and what really motivates me even more, is my ability to generate better performance and better profits for my institution and for the whole of the economy. If I look at the world population, female represent over 50% of the population. If we do not incentivize that big portion of the population to participate in the development of the global economies, we're never going to achieve. We're never going to achieve. We need the whole population. Forget, forget about male, female. All of us, we're part of the same global economy and the world. So we need to work hand in hand. Of course, how can we sh uh, close that gap? It is definitely, uh, there are different ways. One way that I'm uh, trying to follow, which is an individual interest because of the second reason that I pointed out, the economic reason. So in my own organization, what I ma made sure that I hire people based on merit, not because they're male, not because they're female, but I do want to have that diversity because I truly believe that if I'm sitting around a table with my executives and they're all male, if I add another resource, that incremental value will be minimal and eventually it will diminish actually. If I bring in a, a female to that table, it sh that person will add different ideas different angle of thinking and probably and not probably i know that person will improve the performance of the whole team now the way i look at it is it is uh, the responsibility of the governments of the policy makers to initiate uh, from from the beginning from on the youth level that to force it in the education of the youth to, be, to show that male and female are both equal and both needs to contribute to the well-being of each country. Second, and I know it's a controversial uh, area, but quotas. I really believe that uh, quotas, in order, but of course, to tie it with merit. I believe quotas are very important. But isn't there an inconsistency there between quotas and merit? Isn't there a trade-off? No, because, because there are, in all of the studies, Nick, okay, it shows that women, they do better in, in, in universities, and they actually contribute, if we look at the Fortune 500, 25 top companies that are, let's call them female friendly, they showed higher performance. And one of those is no doubt Facebook. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and uh, uh, Cheryl, gave, Cheryl Sandberg gave a, um, a terrific speech, which I commend to you, um, uh, at uh, a commencement speech at Barnard uh, last May, I guess it was, um, looking at these issues. And, and I really encourage you to go and, and, and Google it. But Cheryl, can you talk a little really? bit no. <laughs> <laughs> about, um, or? <laughs> it's on YouTube, which is Google. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about not only what the corporate sector needs to do to create greater opportunity for women employees, but also maybe what women themselves need to do? Yeah, so I think um, all of these relate that what we basically have is an ambition gap all around the world. We have equality nowhere for women, and we have two very different forms of an ambition gap. In the developing world, as many people said here, we have an ambition gap at the societal level. We say we want to educate our girls as much as our boys, but we don't mean it. We don't really do the things we need to do. In the developed world, we have an ambition gap at the personal level. And the data shows this super clearly. So in the United States, women got 50% of the college degrees in 1981, 30 years ago, 31 years ago. And ever since then, women have made progress at every level. Every year they get more college degrees, more graduate degrees, they enter more jobs, they become more junior managers. They've stopped making progress at the top 
in the last 10 years. We're basically stuck in corporate America, 15%, 16% of C-level jobs and board jobs. If you look at the numbers around the rest of the developed world, the numbers are way worse, not better, and there's still complete stagnation. And if you poll women in the developed world, they're not as ambitious as men. So when there was a study in The Economist published, if you ask women to self-identify as very ambitious, in the United States, 36% will say that. In China or Brazil, Brazil is 59%, China is 66%, and India is 85%. And so, ironically, in the places where you have the equality of education and women are even exceeding men, you actually don't have the personal ambition, ambition levels. And I could go in all day of the reason, the root cause, but I'll hit them very quickly. We don't raise our daughters to be as ambitious as our sons. Last month, there were t-shirts sold at this Gymboree, which is a very large chain of like kid scores, that said, smart like daddy for the boys and pretty like mommy. Not in 1951, last month. Little girls are called bossy. Anyone at Davos was a girl who was called bossy? If you got to Davos, you were that. I was. I challenge you, go find someone and watch them call a little boy bossy. You won't see it. They're not bossy. That's the natural order of things. And then it goes all the way through. We've tried to equalize things in the workforce. We haven't equalized things in the home. In the United States, if a couple both work completely full-time, the woman does more than twice as much in the home as the man. You can't get to equality when you're not in the home. And the most important point is that success and likability are positively correlated for men and negatively correlated for women. As a man gets more powerful and successful, he is better liked. As a woman gets more powerful and successful, she is less liked. So from early childhood, through marriage, through, through adolescence, all the way through, we reward men every step of the way for being leaders, for being assertive, for taking risk, for being competitive. And we teach women as young as four, lay back, be communal. And until we change that at the personal level, we can't change this. And we really have to go out there and say, there's an ambition gap. We need our girls to be as ambitious as our boys. We need our boys to be as ambitious to contribute in the home. And we need our girls to be as ambitious to achieve in the workforce. Yeah. <laughs> Point well taken, Cheryl, but isn't there a danger that then you're letting CEOs off the hook? That they can say, well, you know, I'd love to create greater equality in the workforce, but until parents raise their daughters with greater equality, then I can't achieve it. I mean, I don't want yeah. to let, these, let yeah. people here off the hook in that sense. I never let anyone off the hook. Good point. Equal maternity and paternity leave. How do we expect our husbands to do as much as the wives if they don't, if they don't get equal leave? It's okay as a woman in the workforce, sometimes not always, to leave and take the child. We need to let men leave and take care of the child too. We need flexibility of all type. We need men to understand the success and likability point and women. It is super important. If you watch, and I'm sure everyone here has had this experience, you watch the CEO, typically a man, talk about his senior team. He goes around, he talks about everyone's strengths and weaknesses, right? We've all seen this. And then he gets to the woman, the one woman who reports to him, and he says, she's great at her job. She's just not as well liked as the man, men, with no understanding that, of course she's not. That's what the data shows really clearly. We need to understand that when men negotiate for their own salaries, everyone wants to work with them more. But when women negotiate for their own salaries, everyone, men and women, want to work with them less. You teach people that. I talk about this hugely openly. And the next time a woman's sitting across from a man and she negotiates, they have a different reaction. And that really has to come from the top. And understanding that there are different challenges and the structures to support them have to come from the very top. So guys, you're back on the hook. Um, now, we all agree about the importance and the benefits of educating girls, of seeing the girl effect come to pass, of achieving greater equality. Um, and I mean, the World Economic Forum believes in that, and yet 83% of the people here are still male. And so, I want Talal al Zain raised the issue of quotas. I'd like to throw that issue among the rest of you. Um, is that a way to accelerate progress? Would you recommend that? I'll throw that open to whoever wants to, to grab that. Michelle. 
Well, the, the, the experience of Norway is very interesting. It's five, six years ago, they, uh, first of all, uh, offered voluntary quota at the boards of the CEOs. It didn't happen, so they had to meet it mandatory by law. But after five years, when they finished all the boards of their companies, uh, all the studies show higher performance. So it's not, because one of the things is, it's not quota for quota. It's what our women can contribute. What can they do better? And, the, and all the studies show that women can improve the performance, being in a board, being in a senior management team, being at, at different positions. So, and also in politics, the same thing. Women can improve the quality of politics, can improve also the kind of policies that can implement. And, and really, I think that uh, it's true that we have to link quota with merits. But why do we also ask, only ask that when we're talking about women? We also need men in any position to be with the right capacity and with merits. So I think it's, at the end, it's a false dilemma. Because to women, we, to, we ask them to be perfect. We need everyone to be as good as possible. And as, as you know, India has uh, passed legislation to require one-third uh, at any one time of the, uh, of the local panchayat, of the local village councils, to be headed by women. And there's been some very good research showing that it uh, results in better outcomes, um, uh, and in particular more investment in water, which is traditionally women's work, which uh, different perspectives. Would anybody else like to tackle that issue of, yes, of quotas? I, I would say I have lived in a society that judged me on something very silly, uh, the color of my skin. And people talked about us. They legislated about us and then Lo and behold, they are, they are surprised that because they have not invested in us, they have not asked how we feel about whatever, they are able to pontificate about us. We're doing the same, really, with women. We, we were discriminated against on the basis of something about which I can do nothing. I mean, I can try until I'm blue in the face. Blue. <laughs> uh, I can't change the color of my skin. We move from there and we penalize people for something about which they can do nothing, their agenda. And, and we're surprised having made laws that benefit others, that the performance on the side, oh, well, it, it will satisfy you say, oh, well, look, they are not, they're not so good. And, well, then the world looks up and you remove these artificial barriers and the world discovers, hey, there is in fact a Nelson Mandela, you know, coming out of this community. And I believe we are impoverishing ourselves when we do what we do to women. You know, we are actually made for this interdependence that each brings peculiar gifts and attributes. You know, when we were, we were dealing with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, somebody studied uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and found out something very interesting. They said, when the men came to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Almost invariably, they told a story about themselves. Equally, when women came, almost all of them 
told a story about someone else. About others? Yes. That there's, we, 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 are, we are really impoverishing ourselves. That there are gifts, gifts that will, will develop as they mesh into other gifts. We men find ourselves very interesting. Um, <laughs> I'd like to now um, open it up uh, to some questions from the audience. The lights are such that it's hard for uh, us to see, but raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. We have a couple of mics uh, right here. Uh, if you just hand it to somebody with, a, uh, with their hands up, that would be great. My name is Song. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Song Joo Kim. No. Uh, there's another mic coming toward you, I think. My name is Hong Joo Kim from Asia, Korea. Where very you speak much, up a little bit? Yeah, very much women are discriminated because Confucius tradition. I mean, Korea and Japan used to be the worst case. I just want to touch, touch up a few just a simple question or just suggestion or comments. Uh, the, uh, Sandberg, uh, Sir Sandberg, I appreciate what you said. I wonder whether women's leadership always, always should be based on ambition. We don't have to imitate men. I think it should be more based on vision. We want to inherit a better future for our younger generation. Therefore, our vision should be succeed to serve. That's my motto. I just want to touch up because it's a, it's a knowledge-based economy. You've got to take on leadership anyway, but not the same ambition like a man drive. That's what, look at what happened all this investment banking, destroy the whole world. And just to touch up on Michelle Bachelet, I look at the UN. This is um, such an important entity. I mean, Ban Ki-moon is a good friend of mine. Just such a sad to see such an important cause work like a Copenhagen Treaty failed because Security Council did not say yes. Why is that? Because we are going to now, you know, again, the destroyed environment of our future generation. So my wondering is how you can take on women's initiative, creating on the Facebook or Twitter, whatever, 10 million, 20 million, million women can talk about this issue if the UN cannot pass on this uh, you know, environment issue or you know, global warming issue by this uh, obstacle of a security council, we have to condemn them. So how can you empower with this using IT? We're and short on talk? time, so yeah, just let, one let's last <laughs> comment. stop there. And, can, uh, I, can I just last yeah. comment to Thailand? Can I? Yeah. Just, uh, we, want to ask, we want to give several people just, a chance to ask what, questions. Can I? Can I? Could you? Um, I'm a little bit ambitious here, can I? Just okay. a one. Ten seconds. One, yeah, ten seconds. <laughs> this is um, um, Thailand. And I know one fourth of the men traveling to Thailand, sexual uh, trafficking. While you are the prime minister, could you, could you stop women, especially from infant to age, whatever group, serving men for sexual slavery? slavery. Thank you. Um, um, you know, so I think your question on ambition to lead and ambition based on vision, they're not mutually exclusive at all. In fact, a lot of people, men and women, who want, have a really big ambition to change the world, understand they need a leadership role to get there. But we really do, in order for women who have vision to be able to have impact, it has to be okay for them to have the ambition to lead as well. Because without it, I promise we will stay in a world that's completely run by men. I just, um, I, I want to add one little thing to that question. I think that uh, it's important to have the ambition. It's important the education, as you said, from the home. But it's important also in the society to have big models. And I want to just build it very more, uh, the anecdote of uh, pre uh, President Tarja Halonen. She was nine years president in Finland. She went to a, a kindergarten. She asked the kids what they want to be when they were older. And the typical answers, you know, firefighter, doctors, like economists, lawyers, and so on. And then she asked a little boy, six years old, I said, don't you want to be president of Finland? And he answered very seriously, no, in this country, men cannot be president of the republic. <laughs> because all his life, he has seen a woman in the, in the presidency. So, so we need, in terms of creating this uh, hunger, not for, I mean, in my culture, ambitious sounds bad eh? right. for women, because we were, we were uh, teached that way. 
But ambitious can be also a positive force, depends how you use it for. And in terms, very quickly, because I took my time, on Rio Plus 20 and climate change, we have an opportunity now. In June, we have the, the high-level uh, uh, summit on, on, on not only climate change, sustainable development on the three pillars, social, economic, and uh, environmental. And we're going to do, we're working very strong so uh, to make a reality all these politically correct statements that women are in the central of the solution of, of environmental and, and social and development issues. So we are working very strong. We're going to have a very high level panel with head of state, head of government, female head of state, head of government, but also we want men by us. Because as Archbishop Tutu said, we need men and women working for women's rights and women's empowerment. Okay. Madam Prime Minister. Yes, to answer, answer you about well, the uh, problem of, of women in Thailand. So I think on the, the positive uh, point that I think the first thing that we have to back to the root cause of the problem that the education must be in place in, in terms of uh, give them the, the chance of uh, study and equalize of the between male and female. So we have to bridge this gap. So that's why like uh, the policy in Thailand, we set up the foundation of a uh, female. The first of the objective of the foundation is the first thing that help female to access on the financial because they need the basic of financial to survive themselves. I don't think that lady will, will do something that bad for ourselves uh, if, they don't have, if they have enough money. So this is the first thing that's, that's why the, our foundation is start for for help women to access or the financial and second that give them the opportunities to get the knowledge and help them in terms of the legal because sometimes fit out the education so they don't understand how to survive or understand how to protect themselves especially the youth or the female youth so I think this is more important so that's why we said that education will come uh, uh, go along with uh, female and last thing that uh, we need to give the world or everyone to understand the environment or understand the underneath of the female. In, in fact, that uh, uh, female as myself, that I can say that if as long as if we give the opportunities to them, and of course that male and female on the balance of the, the uh, male and female must be complement together. And ambitious is more is important, but the qualification and the capable capable or for this job is more even more important. That uh, that will be not uh, that's that we cannot be uh, separate between male and female. So that is will be equalized. So uh, we have to give the chance uh, for both male and female in politics, uh, especially in Thailand for female will be the symbolic of non-violent. So I saw that if we have the proportion of male and female mixed together, first on the personality so we can fulfill on the thing that the man did cover. But of, of course the male cannot do better than, uh, female cannot do better than male in some area. So that's uh, mean the compliment. And non-violent will help, uh, especially in Thailand, we, uh, to, Mr. Tutu will uh, say that uh, in the next consolation. So I use as the feminine to come up with other people and move Thailand forward for reconciliation and a peaceful for my country. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Prime Minister, I have to also say that you speak better English than I do. Oh, <laughs> Um, let's, uh, I, I, we'll take a, a, maybe a couple more questions and then try to answer them collectively because we're uh, running a little low on time. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Margaret Kamar from Kenya, Minister for Higher Education. I want to agree with Sandberg that early socialization of our children shaped them differently and whatever difference is created at the home front gets carried over for a very long time. Uh, we only passed our law, our constitution the other day, and we now new constitution in Kenya. We said one third political positions and all positions should go to women, but thank God for you and women. We are still searching for those women to come forward, in spite of the fact that education has 
has given us quite a number of women. I wanted to ask out of that, uh, the Thailand experience, do you, how did you deal with the socialization, cultural socialization early in the years? How is it that uh, you are okay, uh, you say that you don't have, you have gender equality at this level. Did you have that issue and how did you deal with it? Okay, and we'll go ahead and take, I must say there's no ambition gap here in this audience. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to uh, uh, encourage other questions and we'll just take a few questions and then address them together. Gary Halgan with IJM. Nick, you and Cheryl brought out in Half the Sky the subtext of violent abuse and oppression that exists, really permeates the life of the poorest women and girls in the world, and just interested in signs of hope or interventions that work in that area. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lauren Gunderson. I'm a playwright and a screenwriter, and I'm very interested in um, sex selection and how uh, that uh, the very fundamental unchoosing of girls before they can even prove themselves and provide models um, for, for other women in the world, uh, how that affects you and um, what thoughts you have on that? Um, and uh, selection. sex selection, yeah. yeah. Um, let's take those questions and also let me, just to mix it up a little bit, throw in one more and then each, uh, and the, the question I'd like to throw out is whether a world in which there is greater gender parity would look particularly different. And in particular, I mean, it, it always strikes me that in um, you know, that the most, the strongest, the best advocates I know of for greater equality are not uh, bleeding heart columnists, not any of us here. It's these hard-bitten American generals in Afghanistan. Because one of the things they've learned is that if more girls are going to school in a particular district in Afghanistan, there'll be fewer attacks on soldiers there. And so you get these generals sitting around a conference table and one moment they're talking about airstrikes on the Taliban and the next moment they're trying to figure out how to get more girls in school because they know the difference that will make in security in Afghanistan. And so um, why don't we go f with you Cheryl and, and work our way back. Um, would this kind of a world look different? Would it be different? I started my career working at the World Bank and I worked on leprosy in India. And the saying at the World Bank at the time, this is the early 90s, was uh, you have to give money, make sure the money goes to the women. Because the women will spend it on their children and the men will spend it on whiskey and other women. Not that anyone here would do that. But the data is pretty clear that women spend 90% of their income on their children and men I think it's more like 40. 30 to 40%. Yeah, I was going to say 40, so I'm glad you corrected me. 30 to 40%. Um, so I think it will make a difference. I think it would be a more peaceful world. Um, if you talk to uh, Lema Bowie, who just won the Nobel Peace Prize, along with two other women this year, and you ask her what needs to change, she's very clear, and she says women in power, because women in power don't have guns and don't rape people. And so, I also would say we might as well try it. Can't get worse. <laughs> <laughs> but I really think that a world where we're... <laughs> <laughs> a world where we're using the population, the gifts of all of our population. Warren Buffett has famously and generously said one of the reasons he has succeeded so much in life is because he only had to compete with half the population. Why not use the talents of the entire population to address the very considerable needs this world has? Thank you, Talal. Uh, for me, I mean, I go back to my original point that, you know, from, if I look at it from an economic point of view, I mean, the World Bank, they, 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 they came up with a study that showed that there is a direct correlation between growth in GDP and better gender parity. So for me, if I look at it from just global economy, it has to be better. Thank you. Michelle? Um, Two words on early socialization, because they ask, in Chilean experience, we did two things. First of all, uh, early uh, child, child education. That's very important because boys and girls learn to, and they grow with the same values and same opportunities. And second, and very important, look at the two textbooks, look at the films, look at the television, which are the models that they are, that which are the, the images that they are sending. In ours, it was always the doctor and man, and the assistant was a woman, very sexy, with a very short skirt. So when we recover democracy, we change all of this stuff. And we put women and girls in a position of power. Sexual selection, we don't have time to look at that, but we think, I think we need to look at it very on the deep roots of them. 
And economical roots is a very important issue because many of the families live when, when, when they have a son, the older, uh, the older uh, parent uh, stay with him. When they have a daughter, the daughter goes to live at his uh, husband's house and the parents don't have nobody to take care of them. So there's, I mean, we can speak about different things, but I think in all these issues, we need to look which are the things we need to change so we really can have a better world for all. And finally, very short, because everyone has spoken here, we represent me, we will have, uh, I would say, a, a world without hunger, without poverty, or at least less hunger, less poverty, uh, hopefully more peaceful, and of course, more equal and balanced. I, there's no question at all that it would ultimately be a more peaceful world. I've, I've said, I can't think of a mother who carries a child for nine months in a womb happily and readily saying, I don't mind if this child becomes cannon fodder. I think, I think, I mean, that w women in in and of themselves are those who bring to life and are nurturing and help 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 us to become more what I mean the, the expression the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world is true. It is true. It is. I think, I'm not a psychologist, but I, I think men, we men, are amongst the most insecure creatures in the world. <laughs> we, uh, in, order, in order for us to compensate for this, we are macho, you know. And yet, who are in fact the people that we admire most, revere? It doesn't turn out to be the macho. I mean, you could, you could say many things about Mother Teresa, but macho wouldn't be one of them. And even when you look at someone like a Mahatma Gandhi, it's, it's, it's a gentleness, a tough gentleness, that is something that we find. I, I hope, I mean, that I might, before I go into the grave, see, see a world which is more gentle, which is more caring, which is more sharing. In, in our country, we have an expression that a mother can share even the eye of a fly. Women, generally, are those who nurture, who bring to life, and who hold life together. And for goodness sake, let's, we've, we've tried for centuries, we've made a mess. Let it, let, let, let them try out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Prime Minister. 
So I just, uh, I think all, all the speaker has been expressed or the, the thing, but for, for me just really uh, would like to add uh, some more point that if we have, uh, women have more chance to be a uh, leader. So I think the first thing on the social, uh, that's I already mentioned that we fulfill from the area of the uh, female don't have, uh, male don't have. And the first, uh, and another thing that the social, you will see the world has someone who caring or the male and caring or the children or the kids. So this is the good combination between male and female. And last thing that for, for the women to be more in case of the number of the leader, so the leader can be both on the private sector and government. For private sector, if uh, you have uh, two combination between male and female, good thing for female is female more detailed and more concentrated. So I think this is thing that sometimes uh, in terms of the business needs someone to be like uh, have the vision, go uh, ambition, vision, and sometimes need someone to keep more detail and concentrate in the detail. That's at the area that I see the uh, strength of the female has. For the po uh, politics, politics that uh, of course that are the non-violent like the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi that I have chance to meet her. She also the symbolic of the non-violent and she fight for the democracy. So this is the world, real world of democracy. Need the symbolic and need the peaceful. So I think if we have good combination, sometimes the passion of female can help the world and can solve all the problem as long as we sit down and talk together. But anyway, the equal between male and female is doesn't mean significant on the digit number, but it means on the uh, the capable for someone who match with the job or match that for position to help the country and especially if have more chance to female so will be the chance to increase the stability of the economy. Thank you. Thank you. I must say that actually this panel in a sense addressed the question of whether greater female participation diffuses violence. Uh, here we have a panel that is half female and I've got to say it's more civil and if you will less violent than a lot of World Economic Forum panels, don't you think? Um, I periodically said that the, um, the central challenge of the 19th century was slavery, the central challenge of the 20th was totalitarianism, in this century it will be uh, to achieve greater gender equality around the world, and I'd like to ask you to please join me in thanking this terrific panel for addressing that issue. Thanks.